Okay, so do you see my full screen please now? Yes, we can see your screen. Professor. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening, uh, depending on where you are located. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Ranjit Patikam. I'm a professor in Monash University in Australia. Um, so my talk in next 20 minutes uh, is to uh, uh, the understanding of the process of a hydromechanical uh, and then how it influences uh, in geothermal system when we use uh, CO2, of course, uh, with the reservoir uh, uh, or formation uh, fluid that is water. Uh, so that's the outline of the presentation. So I'll give a little bit of introduction to uh, geothermal energy and its potential. Uh, and then I'll be talking about uh, the application of uh, CO2 as a, a circulation fluid or as a stimulation fluid uh, in geothermal uh, uh, reservoirs uh, to extract the heat. Uh, and then I'll be talking about uh, uh, studies that we have carried out, one based on the experimental study, the other one is based on the some modeling work. Finally, I will conclude um, with some results uh, and uh, uh, some discussion part. Um, so if you look at uh, the energy demand and then the consumption, uh, so there are three areas where uh, the 80% of the energy is consumed uh, by three sectors, uh, the residential and commercial, and then transport, uh, and then manufacturing industry. Yeah. And also I must stress here that uh, the mining industry also consume more than 10% of uh, energy. That's a significant, uh, uh, the energy intensive industry. Yeah. Now, if you look at the uh, energy demand for next uh, 20, 30 years time, so it's going to increase by um, over 30 to 40%. Now, if you look at the energy coming from today, so it's predominantly coal and gas uh, is actually supply the energy to us. Uh, but I think it's going to change that equation. Uh, so over the next uh, 20, 30 years time, the renewable energy is going to play a major role. But it's still geothermal energy is, is not really contributing much. This is where we, uh, all of us uh, meeting together today uh, during these workshops uh, to let the community know that the importance of the geothermal energy as a renewable energy. Most people even do not know uh, what is geothermal energy and whether geothermal energy is a renewable energy or not, because media does not talk about uh, the geothermal energy. They always talk about uh, solar, wind, uh, hydropower, and so on and so forth. Um, so I co-authored a paper with uh, Professor Chandrasekharam sitting over there, so about the CO2 emission from renewable um, sectors uh, such as solar power, hydrothermal, and in fact, uh, AGS. Uh, if you look at this, of course, this study was carried out for over 25 year life cycle. And if you look at this study, so solar actually contributing very large uh, amount of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour. But if you compare the geothermal is close to 500 grams per kilowatt hour. The reason solar actually contribute that much of uh, uh, CO2 is because uh, they had to mine silica. So most of the solar panels, uh, they actually produce from the silica rather than the biosilica. So the, unless uh, we bring the mining industry to a, a sustainable industry, uh, solar panel is still produce a huge amount of CO2. So when we publish this paper in our journal, Geomechanics for Geoenergy and Georesources, uh, that attracted a huge uh, media attention. So in fact, uh, I think in India, so it attracted over 35 uh, media outlets. Uh, so that gives, uh, in fact, a huge uh, boost to uh, our geothermal research work, uh, not just in India, but of course in Australia and other parts of the world. Uh, let me just uh, talk about a little bit of about uh, the geothermal activities in Australia. So, um, so number of um, research institutions uh, in Australia and then researchers in Australia, so they have carried out uh, quite a bit of um, 
the geothermal potential um, or capacities in Australia. If you look at this map, uh, we are the central part of Australia. So this is where uh, Melbourne, we are uh, staying. Uh, and this uh, the central part of Australia and the northern northwest part of uh, uh, Australia, we have very high heat. They are around four to five kilometer deep underground. So the study shows that if you can tap into 1%, just only 1% of the energy. So we will have energy for next thousands of thousands of years time for whole Australia. But the challenge is how do we get this energy to the surface? Um, as we know that uh, geothermal system, we have two systems, conventional and unconventional, but in Australia, so all of these are uh, unconventional, in particular they are AGS. In other words, uh, we must uh, precondition the rock mass, so we must stimulate the rock mass uh, before uh, getting any heat uh, to the surface. So there are four, so quite a bit of uh, the uh, stimulation techniques needs to be carried out uh, in order to get this heat because this is the rock, uh, it's a crystalline rocks, they are very tight rocks, the permeability is extremely small. So what are the challenges in EGS? Uh, one of the, the challenges, as I mentioned earlier, that because the rock is very tight, uh, so they are for the fluid flow rate extremely small, uh, so the uh, preconditioning of the rock mass uh, must be done. Hence, uh, uh, the heat extraction rate is very, very low. And also the, uh, the current stimulation techniques are really does not work, uh, at least the pilot project that we have carried out in Australia, water-based stimulation really doesn't work. And yet the, when you use the water, we must, we have to use huge amount of water. Uh, that's Australia is one of the driest country in the world. So uh, the water is very precise, they are for, uh, it is something that we really need to think about uh, what is other type of fluids that we can use other than water. Now, when you use, use water, there's another issue that we are creating also, uh, because the water is going to react with the minerals at these extreme pressures and extreme temperatures, uh, that creates uh, dissolution and precipitations of uh, minerals. Uh, that of course, then a result of that one, it will create short circuiting and form is some plugging. So they are for then leading to very, very low flow rates. Um, and then we know that from the pilot studies carried out in Australia, uh, particularly in this place in Cooper Basin, I just showed you in my previous slide that uh, for one stimulation, they had to use huge amount of water. So volume of eight Olympic size of swimming pool, uh, the amount of water that they had to use. Imagine, if you do number of you know, stimulation, we, well, we drill four wells, uh, amount of water that we use. So the, most of the water actually we could not get recovered. So um, why not we talk about different types of fluids? Uh, so yes, water is very scary. People have not looked at uh, CO2 as a stimulation fluid or as a preconditioning fluid, at least for geothermal works. But of course, CO2 has been used in to some extent in the oil and gas industry, uh, but not in, in, in geothermal. And this is where, so our most of the, our work are now focusing the CO2 as, uh, as a stimulation fluid uh, for geothermal energy and as well as in other unconventional uh, uh, energy forms. Now, when you use CO2, of course, uh, the industries, so they can uh, earn credits uh, as a carbon credits. And in fact, the other, because the advantage is that we can also store the, the CO2 in those formations. So unlike water, so the CO2 does not react in dry conditions with the minerals. So there are force so will have a long-term stability. And of course, the CO2 can penetrate into a very micro and then nano uh, pores uh, and then fractures so within these crystalline rocks or tight rocks uh, once you stimulate the rock mass. So therefore, I don't need to actually use very large power uh, so compared with water, so the lower power consumption. So um, if you look at these conditions and these conditions one to five kilometers, so we have temperatures exceeding uh, around 250 degrees C and then the pressures are of around 150 MPa, of course the CO2 is going to 
stay as a supercritical conditions. So this particular study that we have carried out, that we have presented in the paper, is to understand these immunological alterations under these conditions of pressures and temperature with CO2 and with the uh, formation water. So if you uh, look at this uh, the diagram, so on your left, uh, so, the, so there are two zones, zone one and zone two, uh, the zone one where the CO2 is directly injected to hot dry phase. So therefore here the CO2 or critical CO2 will stay as a dry CO2. But away from the zone one, so the, uh, then we will have the formation water and therefore see the CO2 is going to react with the formation water and then you will form the carbonic acid. Uh, so that carbonic acid is going to react with the mineral. So our study has been uh, on the zone two because uh, in the zone one, chemical reaction is not that significant. So, but the chemical reaction in the zone two, because of the uh, formation fluid, is very much significant. So uh, we done uh, two tools, we use two tools. One is experimental tool, the other one is a numerical tool. So let me first talk about the experimental uh, work that we have carried out. Uh, we use particular crystalline rocks for the hard granite uh, extracted from Victoria. So this uh, mineral content of this particular granite has high percentage of quartz and then pretty close uh, uh, and then K feldspar is around uh, almost around 80% or 90%, and then a small percentage of biotite. So we grind this granite uh, into particle size of uh, 150 to 350 uh, microns. So the average particle size was around 250 microns. Uh, and then we take this uh, powdered uh, uh, grind, uh, the, uh, the granite, uh, uh, minerals uh, and they put it into pressure chamber. So one is to 10 ratio, one uh, particle size to 10 uh, water ratio. And then we pressurize the system. Uh, then of course we apply the temperatures and then we put the CO2 into the system. So then the CO2 becomes supercritical CO2 under these pressures and temperature conditions. So that's what we want to actually study. Uh, so how this uh, a minerals is going to behave uh, under supercritical conditions with the reservoir fluid. So, um, so we done uh, the studies uh, uh, on the uh, solid particles uh, using a CM and XRD studies, and then the solution was analyzed uh, using ICP testing. So, finally, we did some uh, modeling work using uh, free QC software. So uh, these are the experimental results. So on the uh, uh, left side, uh, you see the, uh, the element concentrations on the solution, whereas on the right side, you see the, uh, uh, the SEM images on the particles. So um, on the, again, I would like to bring your attention to the, uh, the curves so given on the left side. So there are a number of curves uh, there to represent different types of elements. Uh, we looked at silica, Afferents, aluminium, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium coming from various minerals. We also looked at the uh, times with the time intervals. We take the samples at different time intervals uh, from the pressure chamber, and then we did the, uh, the ICP test. So although there are a lot of curves, but I want to, uh, to take your attention on two curves. One is this green curve, that is the, uh, the magnesium. The other one is on the calcium, the red curve. So we can see that the leaching of these minerals uh, from the solid particles uh, at the very beginning, you can see it's increasing. Uh, so both calcium and then the magnesium. And with the time, so we can see that actually there's a reduction of the leaching out of these minerals from the solid particles. What it happens, why there is a reduction here is that because of the formation of the um, calcium react with the, um, the carbonic acid, it forms calcium carbonate, calcite, and then of course it forms also magnesium carbonate. And then what we observe after 40 days, we don't see any change after 40 days. Um, now, if you, um, if I take uh, your attention to the uh, CM images, uh, uh, depending on the, there are four uh, slides I'm showing here. 
uh, for seven days, 42 days, and then uh, of course 21 days and 70 days. Uh, so you can see that uh, because of the dissolution of the different type of minerals, then particularly if I take your attention for the uh, first figure, so we can see the fitting uh, in K-Felspar, and then you can also see that the dissolution of uh, anthrite mineral. And then you can now see this uh, fi uh, figure, there's uh, the quartz uh, pitting, and then of course pitting of biotite. So, the, so what happens at early stage, so there's a kind of a you know, dissolution of the mineral is taking place. Uh, so now if you look at further um, these uh, CM images, uh, you could see that precipitation of the secondary minerals is also taking place. So let's uh, take uh, after seven days, uh, we observe that uh, precipitation of uh, silica, aluminum, and ox uh, the oxygen. Perhaps this may be kaolinite, but we don't know, but that's why we put a question mark here. And then after 14 days, we pretty much just saw exactly the same things, but for the increase in the area. But after 42 days, uh, we observe uh, the precipitation of um, rich in calcium, magnesium, ferrous, and so on and so forth. Probably this might be light minerals. And then you can see in after 70 days in a K pale spa, uh, the minerals, uh, the, uh, the precipitations. Uh, we also observe around 42 days uh, in formation of the calcite uh, and then smectite, uh, and then of course k spa and then so on and so forth. Now these are the CM images, but we also need to actually make sure that uh, because we cannot exactly say these are the minerals, then we done uh, the XRD analysis. From the XRD analysis and then from the CM images, now we can certainly confirm that. So it forms uh, kaolinite, it forms smectite, and it, it forms elite. These are the clay minerals. They form actually out of bound here. Yeah. So uh, now let me to take you to um, show you some of the uh, uh, modeling work that we done. Uh, we use a free QC software. So this is a commonly commercially available uh, software to um, they look at things in a geomechanical aspect. Uh, uh, we use this particular database to get the data, and then a saturation index was calculated using this particular equation. So when we calculate the SI, if SI is greater than zero, it shows that the uh, so most likely scenario is a precipitation of the mineral is taking place, but when SI is uh, smaller than uh, uh, zero, then perhaps it's a dissolution is taking place. And the dissolution and the precipitation uh, were calculated using these two equations. So all of these things are available in the free QC software. We just need to go and uh, choose the relevant equations. So um, now this slide shows you that uh, two types of uh, data here. So one is experimental data. You can see that, so the x-axis is a, a dash, and then y-axis is element concentrations. Um, so the only symbols we given all the way up to uh, 70 days, these are the experimental data, so, whereas this dotted line, so the lines are the uh, modeling data, so modeling uh, results. Um, so you could see that very good fit uh, between the experimental data and then modeling data for with these three. So therefore we have very good confidence of uh, our modeling results. Uh, and then we use this modeling, um, this, this data to predict uh, to over 200 days. And uh, you might ask why we did not uh, model these things for let's say five years or 10 years or 50 years or 100 years, because most of these uh, geothermal wells, uh, if we construct uh, as a commercial projects that might could that perhaps will go up to 50 to 100 years. The reason is that because of experimental data in a very short period of time, 70 days. So uh, now these experiments are now being carried out for next two and a half years. Then we will have the experimental data all the way up to here. Then we can use this data to predict for probably 10 years time, 20 years time and 30 years time. Yeah, professor, you have two minutes, please. Yeah, so I think I'm there. So now this, uh, the, the data shows that uh, one is on this side. So there are two uh, boxes. One is a blue box. The other one is a pink color box. So one shows that uh, the, um, the, uh, the 
one is dissolution of the minerals the other one is uh, uh, the precipitation of the minerals these are the precipitation of you can see that early days uh, so the precipitation is not that significant but the latter part of the uh, uh, the period so precipitation is governed so uh, so initially you will see that uh, the uh, the dissolution is significant but then followed by the precipitation uh, so what are the the conclusion that we can make from this study so uh, we know that uh, because of the subcritical co2 it dissolves in water and then so it 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 uh, release uh, alkali sodium and the calcium and then alkali uh, metal, and the metals into the medium so we as we just now explained so initial dissolution of the minerals uh, causes surface splitting and then that facilitate the smooth flow that is certainly is good for the extraction of the you know heat from the system but then of course in the secondary the uh, the mineral deposition or precipitation is taking place so these are the type of minerals uh, the calonite smectite and elite is a low, over the long term now dissolution process of mineral is dominated by of course the precipitation process later on now important uh, the um, the observation we made here that so because of the uh, the precipitation of those uh, clay type of uh, minerals the outer boundary the, this outer boundary actually act as a barrier or sealing layer so therefore uh, we can keep the co2 in this system um, so the in the longer term uh, because uh, the, because this provides a very uh, impermeable zone so um, the final conclusion that you know from this study we make here is that uh, if we couple CO2 uh, with uh, geothermal recovery, we can do two things, actually a number of things. We are, um, the industry can get the credits uh, because of the storage of CO2. We can extract the energy much, much better than the water-based stimulation. I did not present here. So the CO2 stimulation is actually contribute very large increase the permeability than the water-based stimulation. So the overall, so the, here we can use the CO2 as a circulation fluid, CO2 as a stimulation fluid, and that will enhance a huge recovery of geothermal energy that will certainly help us to bring uh, uh, the net zero uh, emission targets by 2030 or 2040 or 2050, depending on their particular country. So with that one, so thank you very much uh, for the listening. Uh, thank you very job. much. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your uh, very informative presentation. If, if we have uh, one question, we can we can take. Uh, I will just look at it. System. Yes, Professor, please. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> well, you know, I know your work. Uh, uh, have you since you are maintaining the pressure in the reservoir? You think there'll be precipitation? There'll be reaction? Yeah, this definitely there's a precipitation is taking place. And this is not just geothermal work, but we also done a lot of uh, CO2 sequestration in the sedimentary uh, basins. Uh, yes, there's a pre pre precipitation is taking place, correct. Thank you.